James. James, hey, are you with us? Phil's voice echoed in my head like someone shouting my name as I sank underneath the skin of the water. I could hear him, but there was no space in my head to formulate a response. I was too busy thinking back to the waterfall of information that came crashing down on me last night at the hands of Miles Black. A monster created by the government for the sole purpose of tracking and killing other monsters. A group of extreme and excommunicated rebels from a violent satanic cult, raising five ancient boogeymen, forming the ultimate royal flush in order to take over the world. Five-headed witches, sacrifices, cover-ups, wendigos, crocodile men. I didn't know how to deal with it all and function as a park ranger in the real world at the same time. Miles had been very clear. 16A was a long shot, living somewhere off the grid. There is a small select group in the agency who were trying to track him down, but due to the history between them and him, anyone from the agency going anywhere near him would likely end in bloodshed. He was plan C at best. Plan A for Miles and us was to find a way to rid a Wolf Lake of Keller. Without Keller, there would be no way to unleash the others, and without them, the world as we know it lives for a little while longer. Plan B was to track down the black-robed people and Alec Jessup. Whatever they're planning with him or these entities, if we get to them first, we may find a way to prevent what they plan to do, or perhaps, maybe even reverse what they've already done. Miles had already tasked Sheriff Ferrar with finding leads on these guys. Miles had told me to keep the details about Subject 16A to myself. His very existence was extremely classified. He was extremely clear to me that the only reason he told me and me alone was to show me the gravity of evil that we were dealing with. He needed my cooperation in order to find some form of vulnerability with Keller that we could exploit. And that's where we are now. I'm going to find the hole that I saw in my vision. James. Phil addressed me sharply, bringing me back into the present. I stared at him vacantly. You okay, kid? He asked concerned. I looked around the car and saw Miles in the passenger seat, giving me his friendly as. You better keep your mouth shut, look. Along with Richard looking at me through the rearview mirror from the driver's seat, with a highly concerned look. I cleared my throat and I steadied myself. Uh, yeah, sorry, I, um, uh, I'm just a little tired, I assured them. Well, sharpen up, we need you to ID the location, Miles commanded, now staring forward out the front window, rapidly scanning the area for the location that I described to him in detail last night. He sounded frantic, rushed and under scrupulous amounts of pressure. James said that it was up an incline. The middle of Wolf Lake National Park essentially is shaped like a dome, with four main trails leading up to its peak. And you said this love heart had the initials H&M inside of it, Phil had asked. Yeah, carved into a tree near this clearing, I had confirmed. 2015, young couple in their late 20s, Henry and Maggie Winston. They came on a three-day camping trip to celebrate their second anniversary. They came with their seven-year-old son, Max. Phil informed before adding, Those trails that lead up the side of the hill, well, they are roughly spaced equally apart. And if my memory serves me correctly, I remember the family took the trail on the south side of the park. This is the best place to start, he speculated. The lack of opposing ideas made it clear that we all agreed with Phil. The car was silent for a moment, the only noise being the cold and dry dirt of the trail floor being thrown into the bottom of Richard's car by the tires as we drove off the inclining road. What happened to them? I asked in a soft voice, to anyone who could provide the answer. Phil and Richard shared a concerned glance in the rearview mirror. Phil turned to me and simply shook his head. 
I mean, come on, James. What else did you honestly expect? Just as we had turned the next curve, I was hit with an overwhelming sense of deja vu. Stop, I yelled. The car came to a sudden halt and everyone turned to face me. I looked around. This is it, I confirmed confidently. Miles nodded before getting his affairs in order frantically. Then, just as everyone was unbuckling their seatbelts, his phone rang. He pulled it out of his pocket and looked at the caller ID. He sighed heavily, looking extremely reluctant to answer it. Uh, hang back guys, I uh, need to take this. He jumped out of the car and walked a little off the trail to take his call. Richard seemed to keep his eyes on Miles until he was completely out of view. Hey Phil, can you grab the cones out of the boot and go set up a roadblock? Richard asked. Phil looked at Richard confused, given how this task was a little below a 20 year old vet and more of a job for say, a recently qualified rookie like myself. He then looked at me as if trying to tell if I knew what this was all about, and my vacant stare gave him his answer. Please, Richard insisted. Phil was a too much of a loyal worker to deny a direct order, twice in a row. He simply nodded and got out of the car, but not before giving me a reassuring look and a friendly pat on the shoulder. He would always have my back, and he wanted to make that abundantly clear. Richard once again eyed Phil leaving as he had done with Miles, and once he was out of sight, he turned to me. James, I'm concerned, Richard said bluntly. About what? I replied. You with Miles. His tone was serious and intense. That wasn't lost on me. I'm just trying to help him stop the thing that's trying to kill me and the other innocent people, Richard. What do you want me to do? I know, I know, but be careful with Miles, James. Uh, the agency. I don't know what Miles told you, but... They aren't the heroic monster hunters he's making them out to be. They are ruthless and sometimes can be the very monsters that they are meant to be hunting. Why do you think I asked for a transfer to here? My eyes widened at his declaration. Wait, you used to work for the agency? I asked, taken aback. Richard sighed, regretting his outburst. Yeah, I did. Since 99 for 10 years of loyal service, I worked my way up the ranks to one of the highest levels in the organization known as the agency. I was an agent closely working under the director of operations, who had just taken over in 2010. I really thought I was making a difference, doing some real good. His sentence trailed off as I noticed he could barely look me in the eye. Richard, what happened? I asked, my tone now as concerned as his was. In 2011 White Mountain National Forest, there was a string of disappearances. Hikers, campers, and we were aware of a cryptic presence in those woods. And our agency saw that it was becoming far too aggressive and we deployed to eliminate it before its existence became public knowledge. We arrived on site. The police were already there. Apparently, another group of campers had been attacked. Eleven dead, but one had managed to get away. He had already told the police about some monster who had ripped his friends apart limb from limb. The DOO requested me and my colleagues get him in a room and to find out what he knew. We put him in a car and took him to the local field office. He sat in that room and described in 100% detail the thing we had been tracking in those woods. The DOO was watching via video link and after the guy had finished his statement, he called us out of the room. Richard had that shameful drop in his gaze again. Richard, I probed not liking where this was going. I just thought that we were going to pay him off, maybe even threaten him. I didn't know the new management would be so ruthless. What happened, Richard? I demanded to know. We shot him. They told us to go back in that room and put a couple of 9mm slugs in that boy's brain. He knew far too much, and he had served his purpose. The next day, I demanded the agency release me from my contract, and this wasn't what I had signed up to, but they told me that wasn't an option, 
But Wolf Lake, a place that I knew a lot about due to the Keller cover-up back in 03. And it was also a national forest with a known cryptid presence. I could be posted there on a permanent basis as a hazard control representative. And I grabbed it with both freaking hands. He said, holding his hands out in a tight, gripping motion. Jesus, and I was such an a-hole to you about Billy. That had to have brought back some horrible memories for you. I'm so sorry. My apology was waved off by Richard. That's not important. You weren't to know. The important thing now, Jim, is that you will be careful with Miles Black or whoever else the agency sends. They'll use you, and they'll exploit you. You are expendable, do you hear me? He demanded my assurance. I hear you, I assured him. I didn't smuggle you into Alaska in the middle of the night so these blood-sucking psychopaths could just throw you back to Keller to serve their needs. Richard said, patting his hand on my shoulder. His eyes flicked up to spot Phil making his way back to the car. Now come on, we better get out, Richard said, opening the car door. Oh, Richard, I interjected. Yeah. Do you know what 16A is? I'm subject to 16A. Richard closed the car door and eyed me very intensely. If Miles has told you about that then, the agency are clearly desperate. And a desperate agency are an even more dangerous agency. Please be careful, James. Richard opened the car door once again and climbed out. I joined him. As I climbed out of the car, I could hear a voice in the trees to my left. It was Miles, and he sounded flustered. I focused my hearing in on him. Sir, sir, I understand, but, but, but sir, I don't think that's necessary. I think that we have a lead here, and we could shut this down today. Uh, okay, sir, I understand. I'll check in tomorrow. He put the phone down and rubbed his face in a highly stressed out fashion. He began to make his way back over to the group, so I pretended to be looking the other way. Right, James, lead the way, Miles instructed impatiently. My spearheaded the group and led the way down the trail towards the clearing. There were a few occasions upon which I questioned if this was the right path. It seemed much straighter in the daytime. But then again, I was injected with an experimental hallucinogenic so I guess that likely contributed to the change in appearance. My doubts lasted no more than five minutes before I had got my confirmation. There it was, carved into a great big pine. H&M. There, I stated, pointing in the direction of the marker. Miles jogged over in an even more impatient manner. So, where is the hole? Show me, he yelled frantically looking around, aiming his shovel at potential dig sites that I might point out. Hold on, hold on, I said, scanning the clearing for any recognizable areas until I had aligned my vision on one particular spot. A surge of memory is sparking in my mind, and for a split second, I once again saw that little boy's pleading face as he was dragged into the dirt. There, I whispered, pointing towards some ground at the base of the tree, just on the edge of the clearing. Miles rushed over while Phil handed me a shovel, signaling for me to join him and Miles in digging up that ground. We dug for around three hours until there was a six-foot crater in the earth, with nothing in it. Miles was flushed, frustrated, and most of all, furious. Are you sure that this is it? Are you freaking kidding with me, James? Because we don't have time for this. I'm sure, Miles, I stated, a little wary of his outburst, but Phil stepped in. Now come on, Mr. Black. Let's all just calm down here, he said. Miles cursed under his breath and waved off his attempts to defuse the situation, and instead went back to digging by himself. Phil went over to Richard and began to whisper questions to him, such as, What's going on? And what's with this guy? When all of a sudden... Oh, holy crap, I hit something. What? I think it's a door. Miles yelled over to us, like he had just found a buried treasure. 
We ran over and began to help him clear the rest of the dirt off the wooden trap door. It wasn't long, however, until we saw this thing had sides. It wasn't a trap door. It was a box. Miles looked at it, confused and troubled. He took out a screwdriver and began to pry the top of the box open. The wood creaked and groaned before finally, the nails had came loose from the panels and the lid popped off. A cloud of musty yellow and brown came pouring out of the darkness in Miles and getting onto his knees, pulled the lid the rest of the way off. We all stared down and our hearts sank. Inside the box was a pair of child's underwear. They looked old and torn and stained. If I had to guess a boy about the age of seven, Miles stared down at them and began to slowly put on a pair of latex gloves. We found Harry and Maggie Winston mangled and violated, hanging from a tree just beyond these trees, where they were camping at. We never found any sign of Max. Well, not until now. Philip informed. Miles looked at him eyes wide, before reaching down and picking up the underwear. He held them up in the air to inspect the front, revealing the back to me, Phil and Richard. We had groaned in horror as Miles looked at us puzzled. He turned the underwear around to see what had gotten us so disturbed. In dried blood on the back of the underwear were the words, Better luck next time. Miles was incensed. He completely lost it. There wasn't much in a 10 meter radius that he didn't beat the living crap out of with a shovel. No, 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 he screamed. His behavior was alarming to say the least. I'll get a team out here and clear this up, Richard said in a professional manner and began to make a call on his phone. Miles' phone began to ring again. He pulled it out of his pocket and once again looked horrified at the caller ID. He composed himself before flipping up the phone and answering. Black. I could faintly hear talking on the other end of the line. It caused Miles to close his eyes and a silent sigh. Uh, no sir, but if we just give the inje- The talking cut him off once again. It sounded loud at this time, like the person was annoyed or angry. Sir, I'm not comfortable with- The voice once again cut him off. Whatever the voice had said, it made the color drain from Miles' face. I understand, sir. I'll get it done. Goodbye. He put the phone down. Miles walked back over to me and Phil with his tail between his legs. What now? Phil asked. I think that's it for one day. Miles confessed in a defeated manner and Phil nodded in agreement. We can meet at my cabin tomorrow and come up with the next plan of action, Philly suggested. Miles rubbed his face and temples while gently nodding back. Meanwhile, Richard made his way back over to the group. The hazard control cleanup crew coming up. We'll make sure this doesn't see the light of day. The public will continue thinking the family died of starvation after getting lost in the night. Keller's reach stays within the circle, Richard said. We were all now nodding our heads in a silent and reluctant agreement. Oh, um, uh, James, Phil, we have a group at the VC. They need to be shown the trails. Could you two handle that? Richard requested. Sure, James, let's go, Phil said, flicking his head back down the trail. Here, take it, Richard said, throwing his car keys to Phil, who grabbed them out of the air. The cleanup guys can fetch me back down. Phil thanked him with a tip of his head. Hey, uh, can you guys give me a lift back down too? Miles asked sheepishly likely embarrassed from his multiple outbursts. Sure, hop in, Phil affirmed. We all jumped into Richard's car and Phil drove us back down the trail, through the park and towards the VC. This group, do they have children? Miles asked tentatively. I thought the question was a little odd and out of the blue. So did Phil, judging by his expression in the mirror. Not sure, probably, why... He had probed. I just don't want any more casualties, Miles said, avoiding eye contact. 
Well, neither do we, Mr. Black. We never have done, but you know as well as I do, it's not as simple as that. Phil snapped, slightly offended by Miles' comment. Well, if we don't find a way of stopping each other soon, the whole keeping this contained thing won't matter a whole lot. Now what the heck does that mean? Phil quizzed. Miles immediately started to shake his head. Is it something to do with that kid, Alex Jessup, going missing? Is there something you're not telling us? Phil continued to demand an answer. No, uh, honestly, I'm just under a lot of pressure and I, uh, bull spit. Tell me. Phil wasn't having any of it. Miles looked at me as if silently asking for backup or to change the subject. But I wasn't comfortable in keeping Phil in the dark. Not about this. Just tell him, Miles, you can trust him. I assured him. Miles looked pissed off, shaking his head and licking his lips in silent rage. Tell me what? Phil asked, becoming increasingly agitated. Miles knew that there was no way out of this one and he let out a loud sigh. In a nutshell, we believe there is a very significant and imminent risk of a rebel group with ties to the Kettle Moraine cult. They're performing a ritual using black magic which would grant Keller and the others a path into this world. Miles let the words sink into Phil. His mouth hung open slightly as he seemed to be looking around for a response. Jesus, what? With a path into this world, Keller wouldn't be bound by the rules of this spiritual rebirth. He wouldn't need you to fear him to come after you. He wouldn't be bound to the forest. He could kill every single living person on this planet at his own free will, Miles added. Phil took a big gulp. You, uh, said, uh, others, he stuttered. Yes, the entities that reside in the five black sites that I told you about yesterday. What I didn't mention is that they are all connected. They were all birthed into the same demonic spirit by the rebel group, using ancient pagan bibles. A sort of black magic recipe book collection in layman's terms. An anthropologist described these entities as ancient boogeymen. Stories that parents would tell their children about monsters who lurked in the woods, waiting to do unspeakable things to bad little kids who didn't do as they were told. The tales date back to pagan times. The Kettle Moraine cult are nothing more than a fanatic band of paranoid delusionists. But this rebel group, they're the real deal. They've already gave us something unworldly a ticket to this world, and it took everything we had and more just to beat one of them. Right now, all five entities are contained in the national parks, but if they raise Keller and the other four, I don't think we stand much of a chance of survival, or anyone else for that matter. Phil didn't even know what to say. It was a lot to take in. Heck, I knew. Phil decided to change the subject. So, how do you plan on warning this new group of campers without making them aware of Keller? Phil had queried. Oh, I, um, I don't know. I'll think of something. Maybe just tell them that there's been sightings of wolves or something. Keep their kids in close sight. Maybe even give them my cell number. Give me a call if they feel vulnerable. I don't know. I'll think of something. Miles assured us. I smiled. That's a good idea, Miles. The least we can do is try to keep people safe while we figure this whole thing out. Exactly. Miles nodded, and he stared out of the car window, into the dense forest. He took out his phone again and began to text someone. Who and what about, I had no idea. We arrived at the visitor center around 25 minutes later. Me, Phil, and Miles made our way inside. We walked up to the desk where Phil began speaking with the desk worker. As he liaised with them, I stood back and waited. I looked at Miles, and the guy looked like he was carrying the weight of the world on his shoulders, massaging his knuckles and pinching the bridge of his nose. I didn't envy him. He needed a result today, and he didn't get it. Clearly, whoever was on the other end of those calls wasn't happy about it. I turned back to Phil, who was being pointed in the direction of where the new campers were waiting. 
We looked over to the waiting area in the back corner of the building, where we saw a family eagerly awaiting our arrival. Two parents, two kids, one girl and a boy. The girl was around eight or nine and the boy was around six or seven. Phil went over and introduced himself to them and explained that he and I would be showing them a few good places to hike and camp. I watched the two kids, innocently attempting to amuse themselves as they eagerly waited for their adventure to begin. The two parents laughed and joked. I didn't want to amuse them so much, but their laughter and general happiness was infectious. I found myself smiling. I turned to face Miles and saw that he was looking at them too. He wasn't smiling, however. He was pale, nervous, and completely on edge. No doubt, the sight of this happy-go-lucky foursome without a care in the world. No idea that they were at risk of being subjected to the worst kinds of evil by a malevolent entity who roams this very forest. They seemed incredibly enthusiastic as Phil discussed possible campsites and good trails to hike on. They wanted the best possible experience while camping in Wolf Lake. If only they knew the truth. After a brief introduction, he brought them over to us in order to introduce them to myself. Just as I had held my hand out to shake the father's hand, Miles took a step forward and took charge of the exchange. Hello, Mr. and Mrs. Our Eland, Michael and Judy Eland. These are our kids, Jesse and Dana. Kids say hi to the man. The father said, looking down at his children, prompted them to show good manners. Hi, they both said, sheepishly in unison. Miles smiled at their shyness and waved it off. Please, uh, call me Miles, Miles Black. I am the head of hazard control here, and before you go off with my esteemed colleagues, I need to have a private word with you. Miles began to usher them towards a vacant office towards the back of the VC. Oh, I hope there's nothing wrong, the father threaded. Miles shook his head and pressed his lips together, assuring the man that there was nothing to worry about. Oh, absolutely not. It's just a few procedural things, mainly for your safety and protection. Please, leave your bags here and my colleagues will take them into the cloakroom while we go through everything. As Miles said this, I took a step forward towards the luggage, assuming that he meant myself. But just as I had moved towards it, another man beat me to it. He was dressed as a Wolf Lake VC employee, but in my whole seven months on the job... I had never seen him. I assumed that he was new. Miles thanked the man and he carried the luggage in the cloakroom, where the guests and rangers alike stored their tents, their rucksacks and sleeping bags while in the VC. Phil looked at me and simply said, Come on kid, let's grab a coffee. You can catch me up on how messed up we actually are. Me and Phil stood on the edge of the main trail, 200 yards away from the VC cradling our warm coffees to go on the cold a December afternoon. So, just in case I misheard Miles earlier, this reincarnated child, a psychopath who has made our lives hell for over a decade and a half, now could potentially be risen into a physical, undead nightmare with no bound to our national park, with all the abilities to destroy the entire world, and with 100% likelihood of doing just that. And not only that, but he brings what sounds like the four horsemen of the underworld with him. And the only hope to stop this from happening lies upon you, me, Richard, and a man, who literally an hour ago beat the living crap out of a tree with a shovel. Am I in the right ballpark here? Phil asked, fictitiously. It does sound bad when you put it like that, doesn't it? We both shared a chuckle. We were used to all this by now. We had learned to deal with it in our own way. Uh, Phil, there's something else, I confessed. Phil promptly halted drinking his coffee with immediate effect. His eyes widened slightly as he awaited the next in this series of dark bombshells. Well, there's a plan B in place. I want to be honest, it's more of a Hail Mary. Should we not find a way of stopping Keller before the black robes raise him? Then, we only have one hope of stopping what comes next. And what might that be, son? I shiftly looked over my shoulder to make sure that Miles or anyone else for that matter wasn't within earshot. 
There is a project in the agency that Miles is from, known as Subject 16A. Right, Phil said. He's a monster. That was created by a scientist called Dr. West for the government in order to track, hunt, and kill other monsters. The entity that Miles was talking about in the car that they had just managed to bring down last year. Yeah, well, this 16A helped them do it. They're trying to locate him as we speak using a satellite. Phil interrupted me. This stuff honestly just gets crazier. But why do we need to locate him with the satellite? If he was there to help him kill this stupid monster, then where is he now? Phil had asked, puzzled. There was a uh, breakdown in rapport between him and the agency, so to speak. It was really only out of sure luck or fate that he turned up that night to help them bring down that thing. In return for his support that night, there is an agreement to let him live out the rest of his days in peace and freedom. Miles said that if we needed to approach him then, it would be best if it wasn't someone from the agency. Otherwise, things could get a little bit hairy. No, oh, and I suppose that someone's gotta be you, Phil asked with concern. Yeah, Miles thinks that. Oh, Miles, um, he's going down in my estimations the more I learn of him. Sounds like they want to use you as a guinea pig to see how this thing reacts to being approached. Phil snapped. If I don't do this, then we all die anyway. I answered honestly. Phil sighed heavily. Well, what about Dr. West? They created him. Surely they have some sort of influence over him. Can't they approach him and convince him to help? He asked. Yeah, sure, if she were still alive. Phil's eyes widened before they rolled. Jesus, what happened to her? Mom, let's just say she wasn't the most maternal person in the world. Well, let's just say if that day comes, I'll be coming with you, son. I won't let you go alone. Phil assured me, placing his hand on my shoulder. I smiled at him and he smiled back at me. We let each other know that we had each other's backs, no matter what. In the distance, we heard a cluster of voices. We switched from covert to nonchalant in the blink of an eye and turned to the noise. It was Miles and the campers. Okay guys, thank you for your time. I'm gonna leave you with James and Phil, and they'll show you where you need to go. Miles ushered the family into our company, before pulling his phone out and dialing a number. Say goodbye to Mr. Black, kids, the mother instructed. Goodbye, Mr. Black, the kids said angelically and once again in unison. I have to go now, but it's been a pleasure and remember what I've told you, Miles said to them with a wink. Oh, we will, Mr. Black. Thank you for the advice, the father said. Miles turned to me and Phil before us, simply saying, Guys, I can trust you to show these people a good time. I need to get back to HQ to brief my bosses on our findings earlier. I'll be back in a couple of days, and I'll be in touch. Miles said in a highly professional manner. No doubt for the family's benefit. Me and Phil gave him a nod and a wave, and then Miles was on his way. I arrived back in my cabin later that night. I kicked off my boots, sat on the edge of my bed, and fell back, letting these springs of my mattress support my weight and carry my stress. It had been a long day. First, there was getting the middle finger from Keller and finding these seven-year-old remains of a missing child, and then having to explain the double-decker crap sandwich that the world was being served to fill. And then to top it all off, we had escorted the Ellen family on a 15-mile hike to a great little camping spot on the southwest side of the park. We took them there because it's no more than a 10-minute ATV ride from me and Phil. Should we get a call from Miles alerting us to any danger they may be in? I wasn't actually sure of the precise moment that I fell asleep, but it became extremely apparent when I had when I woke up. I was in a cabin on the edge of the bed, but it wasn't my bed and it wasn't my cabin. The outlay and decor were completely different. I stood up and scanned the room. There was something on the table, a pamphlet maybe. Before I approached it, however, something caught my eye, outside of the window. I saw the base of a group of trees and they were huge. The more that I approached the window, the more I saw how high up they went. And that's when something clicked in me, and I approached the pamphlet. 
I looked down at the pamphlet and read the cover. See America visit Redwoods National Park. On the pamphlet, there was a water pastel image of a cabin in the middle of the woods. Surrounded by giant redwoods that were so tall, they proceeded to the top of the image. That's when I realized it. That was the cabin I was in. I placed the pamphlet back on the table and I walked out of the door. I stood outside in the darkness. The only thing visible was the huge trunks of the redwood trees. I walked over to it, placing my hand on its vast surface. I can't lie, I was in pure awe. And that's when something pulled me out of my daze. A drip on my cheek and then another. And then another. I wiped it off with my middle and index fingers and examined the wet substance in front of my face. It was blood. Fresh, warm blood. I winced and looked up. My heart sank. My knees buckled and my head had started to spin. There hanging from the branches were her people. They looked like they had uh, pillowcases over their heads, which had uh, scattered stains seeping through the front of the fabric. They were a family. Two adults, three children, all hanging perfectly next to each other, with their hands and feet bounded by rope. I placed my hands over my mouth and tried my best to not cry out in horror. I stumbled back with the adrenaline pumping through my veins and shattering the stability in the lower half of my body. Then that's when I saw them. Every tree, every branch, as far as I could see, it had people hanging from them. Adults, teenagers, children, even a couple of toddlers. Tears began to spout from my eyes and I couldn't hold them in. And then I heard it. Whistling. I began to follow the noise and I didn't even know why. I followed the sound down a trail that led out of the forest. The whistling became louder and clearer as I approached a large overgrown shrub. The tune was a whimsical and upbeat like whoever was producing it was enjoying themselves. I pulled up the knife from my utility belt, and I hacked away at a few of the entangled branches. I slid my hands in the now separated bush and pried it apart. What I saw froze me. Two bodies lay on the ground, a couple no older than twenty. They looked like young loves a dream. Likely celebrating their one year anniversary or a first valentine together. They were laid side by side, nooses around their necks and hands and feet bound together, just like the others. Except these two didn't have a pillowcase over their faces and I could see them. Their skin was not in great shape, like it was torn up in a ferocious manner. Their eyeballs were missing. As were their ears and even more disturbing of all, their mouths were stitched close. I stood there, staring in pure horror, and then the body started to wriggle. Jesus Christ, they were actually alive. They began to groan softly and tug gently against their restraints. I was so petrified that I didn't even notice that the whistling was now right on top of me. I looked up into the thick green of the treetop where I heard the tune when suddenly it stopped. The branches and leaves shook as something came falling out of them and hurtling towards the ground. I watched as a figure came crashing down to the earth in front of me. It landed with its back to me in its hand. It held the other end of the rope, which was wrapped around the couple's throats. As it fell, the young couple were thrust headfirst into the air. This thing that had descended from above was pale and milky white and in extreme contrast to the black night sky. It had hulky bones yet was incredibly lacking in muscle tissue. Its shoulder blades and ribs looked sharp. The tip of the bones almost piercing the skin of the creature's back. Its arms looked lean. The elbows were in line with the rest of its marrow. And as it tied the end of the rope around the trunk of the tree... I saw that its hands were bony, its knuckles looked like cones, and its nails were bowie knives. I looked up and saw the couple suspended from one of the branches, now surrounded by the other bodies. 
They wriggled a little more vigorously for a few seconds as the oxygen and life drained from their bodies and soon, they were as still as the rest of them. I looked down again and saw the creature was gone. I frantically scanned the area for its location. I began to panic, unable to see it anywhere. But after a few minutes had passed, I began to relax, assuming that it had run away after it was detected. But then once again, I heard the whistling, somewhere in the distance. I squinted my eyes and focused my vision beyond the trees in front of me. Just as I had focused in on a particular spot, the whistling had promptly stopped. The sudden silence startled me. I began to dart my eyes around frantically once again, desperately trying to locate this thing. And then I heard the whistling again this time, but it was right in my ear. I didn't even have the time to react. Before its bony hands gripped my shoulders from behind, the tips of its fingernails dug into my chest and it rested its pointed chin on my shoulder. It pressed its sweaty, scaly skin against my cheek, and its long, snake-like tongue slithered out of its mouth and began to explore my face. Before dipping its tip into my ear, it grabbed a handful of my hair and snapped my head back sharply. Its neck seemed to extend and its face began to loom over mine. Its eyes were like golf balls, with extremely pinned pupils. They bulged out of its head in a highly unsettling way. Its nose looked like it belonged to a witch doctor, and its teeth were mangled and yellowed. I was frozen. I've never been so terrified. I am coming for all of you. It gurgled before letting out a loud cackle. It let its grip on me go for a split second. I didn't hesitate. I ran like crazy into the trees and I didn't stop. I ran and ran until I saw light. I don't know why, but they gave me hope, and I ran towards it. I cleared the trees and found myself on the edge of a cliff, a cliff that overlooked the small town of Ulrich. I looked down to the roads, the shops and houses, and found out what the light was. Fire. The village was burning. It looked like the apocalypse had come to town and with a vengeance. As the flames roared, I heard the screams of people in the distance. They were begging, pleading for mercy. I was so mesmerized, I didn't even hear it come up behind me.